By the end of the 1800s, America was well into the Industrial Revolution. The continent had been settled coast to coast, and the tracks for the Transcontinental Railroad had been laid, connecting the country like never before. However, Boca Raton's pioneer period was just beginning with the extension of Henry Flagler's railroad from West Palm Beach to Miami in 1895 and 1896. The pioneer during this period came to Boca Raton for a chance at a better life, knowing that family and comfort lay elsewhere. Today, we are going to talk about what life was like for pioneer women in Boca Raton. Boca Raton's first women pioneers were the wives and daughters of men who came to farm the rich soil of South Florida at the end of the 20th century. They battled numerous flying and crawling insects, unmitigating heat and humidity, and the occasional tropical storm. Many were from northern middle-class families accustomed to such amenities as electricity, indoor plumbing, markets, and department stores. Floyd Mitchell recalled the rather primitive conditions when she and her husband Joe arrived at their first Boca Raton home in 1923. A two burner oil stove, small ice box, hand pump in the sink, and an oil lamp furnished the kitchen. A chick sale was in the backyard. We would have to take a bath in a zinc tub with water heated on the stove. Joe looked at me, and knowing we had left a home with indoor plumbing and all the modern conveniences of the time, said, are you sure you want to stay? I replied, wild horses couldn't get me away from here. In some cases, when women came to Boca Raton, they had to abandon the cultural traditions they grew up with to start new ones. Seda Kawashima Sakai followed Joe Sakai to Florida after they were married in 1907. They formed the first of many families at Yamato. The change from traditional Japanese society was profound for many of the women, including Zeta. They went from a life of relative comfort to coping with the heat, bugs, and endless sunshine of the raw South Florida scrubland. They also abandoned the kimono and many of the old ways it represented. Florence Purdom came to Florida with her husband, Perry, in 1905 to help the Burt Rollerson's family with their farm. Florence had 11 children and raised the surviving eight in a typical farmhouse with kerosene lamps and a pitcher pump in the yard. Perry did not allow Florence to work in the fields, but the older daughters, Eula and Viola, helped with the farm work as well as assisting their mother with the children and housework. Black pioneer women were employed as domestics, laundresses, and cooks for area residents and seasonal visitors. They played important roles in local religious and social activities, teaching Sunday school, organizing gatherings, and cooking for fundraisers. Pioneer Belle Demery came to the area in the 1910s with her husband to seek a new life. She found employment as a domestic and hand packing vegetables for the local farmers while raising her large family. Nettie Cheesebro came to Boca Raton in 1903 with her husband, Frank, and their three children. A sewing machine, a washing machine, an organ, and a phonograph brought with them from Michigan helped ease a traumatic transition. Nettie worked side by side with her husband, grubbing, raking, and planting to make their large farm a success. She was later paralyzed, the result of lifting a heavy fertilizer sack. Pioneer life was in no way safe. Locals almost never sought out a doctor's care. Doctors were few, far away, and too expensive. They only visited the doctor if it was an absolute necessity. In cases where the doctor was judged to be an unnecessary expense, women acted as the primary healers. If you got sick, you turned to your wife, mom, aunt, grandma, sister, or neighbor. Diane Benedetto, knee Imogene Ellis Gates, was born in 1916 to Vermonters Harley and Harriet Gates. She recalls that for a cold or a sore throat, mother would mash up onions and kerosene into a cloth, which was placed around the neck or on the chest. If you stepped on a nail or cut your foot, you would apply a poultice of salt pork or bread and milk wrapped in a rag. Mud packs were the thing for bee stings or insect bites. Spider webs were also used to stop bleeding and keep wounds free from infection. Apparently, they are rich in vitamin K, which promotes clotting. 
Pioneer Louise Williams recalled her mother would collect palm of Christian leaves to help bring down a fever. Palm of Christian, because the leaves looked like a hand, was the term for a non-native castor bean plant, as in castor oil, which once grew in profusion in empty fields here. Castor beans are the source of the deadly toxin ricin. However, the leaves plus some vinegar were made into a poultice to be placed on the forehead. By morning, the leaves were dried up and the fever was gone. Asafoetida was a common folk remedy. It is a gum resin used for stomach ailments, but also was a remedy for respiratory conditions, including the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. It was bundled into a cloth and worn around the neck as a preventative medicine. The smell was so bad that it repelled other people. Also an effective preventative technique. It is also used as a flavoring, and yes, you can still buy it. Jacqueline Harvey recalled several patent medicines, including Black Draft, a laxative, and Father John's, a non-alcoholic cough syrup made of cod liver oil. My father believed in three sixes. If he felt like he was coming down with a cold, he would go and get him a bottle of three sixes. It's a quinine. It has a lot of quinine in it, and Papa would take that. The Three Sixes brand was sold as recently as 2010, but with more modern ingredients, thankfully. Life was not all work for women in Bogorton's early days. Social gatherings were equally important to the survival of the young community, providing networking opportunities as well as rest and relaxation for women as well as the men. Traveling and going for picnics at the Hillsboro Lighthouse to take silly pictures and take in the view. Other activities that everyone participated in was fishing, fish fries, boating, and exploring. Women, as often as men, would explore the wilds surrounding Boca Raton, which was still very undeveloped. In the years following World War I, a new economic prosperity, the completion of Dixie Highway, and the new popularity of the automobile helped initiate a Florida land boom pioneers still call the boom. New residents were drawn to the area by the investment possibilities and the lure of a warm climate. The coming of the Meisner Development Corporation, Villa Rica, and other boom time developments literally put the little town of Boca Raton on the map. At the same time, the new prosperity and the passage of the 19th Amendment helped change attitudes among and about women in America. The flapper with her short skirt and bobbed hair and very different ideas about the role of women in society became the new symbol for American womanhood. In Boca Raton, the influx of new residents and a change in mores encouraged the growth of cultural, social, and educational opportunities for women. Pioneer life in early Boca Raton was not for everyone. It was often a difficult and dangerous way of life that took women away from their families and traditions. It was a reversal of time away from modern conveniences. However, those that stayed did not regret their choice to do so. They stayed for the weather, they stayed for the community they became part of, and for the new opportunities that arose. They are the women pioneers of Boca Raton and they created the society in which you live.